Okay, problem number 15. Given that this is a parallelogram, how can we guarantee that this is a rectangle? So in order to answer this question, you have to know what makes a rectangle a rectangle, how that differs from just being a regular parallelogram. So we have this graphic organizer that you've received that allows you to think about how something can be proved to be a parallelogram, a rectangle, a rhombus. So look at the two properties we know for a rectangle. There's at least one right angle, in which case all of them are going to end up being right angles in the corners, and the diagonals are congruent. So those are the two ways that we're going to prove that this is a rectangle. Now let's take a look at what they gave us. Now the first one says RV is congruent to TV. Okay, so the fact that these two adjacent sides are congruent, that's not going to prove that this is a rectangle. That's going to prove that this is a rhombus. So that's not what we want. So it's not going to be choice F. Next, RT is perpendicular to SV. All right, so RT and SV, those are the diagonals. If they're perpendicular, that's a great property, but it's for a rhombus and a square but it's not for a rectangle, so G is not going to be our answer either. Next, VS, which is a diagonal, bisects angle RVT. Okay, so the fact that this angle was bisected, again, this is a property of a rhombus. So all three of these so far have been rhombus properties, which you definitely need to study and need to know those rhombus properties. But this is not what's going to prove that it is a rectangle. Let's hope the last one works. SV, which is one diagonal, is congruent to RT, which is the other diagonal. Ding, ding, ding. That's the one. Diagonals are congruent when your shape is standing straight up. So like a rectangle, um, a square, an isosceles trapezoid. Right? It's nice and even, and that's when your diagonals are going to be congruent. Okay? You need to study that chart so that you can make sure that you understand how to prove that some shape is what it is, because sometimes it'll appear on the coordinate plane. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, here's another right triangle. You should notice that this is a right triangle, so you're thinking about all those right triangle things that you've learned about. Pythagorean theorem and trig, yada, yada. Now, in this case, we're asking to find the angle of elevation to the top of the building. Remember, if you're elevating, you have a horizontal line and you have an angle going up from that horizontal line. So in this case, our angle of elevation, that's going to be right here. That's what we're looking for. So I'm going to put in a little symbol, theta, to represent that it's missing. I don't know what that angle is. That's a symbol that represents an angle. And I'm going to use some trig. So I'm going to label in opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse, which is missing. So no H. We're not going to use H. So if I'm using O and A, that means I'm using TOA, SOCA, TOA. So I'm going to use TOA, tangent tangent of your angle theta or x however you want to call it your missing angle equals your opposite over your adjacent so 148 over 200 now to get theta anytime you're looking for an angle you're going to be using all those inverse trig functions sine to the negative one cosine to the negative one tan to the negative one so in order to get theta what we're going to do is we're going to get the inverse tan, tan to the negative 1, of 148 over 200. And when we put that into our calculator, it's going to spit out the correct angle measure. Okay, so in my calculator, I'm going to type 148 divided by 200. I'm going to get this decimal, 0.74, so I want to take the inverse tan of 0.74. So right now, I only have tan, the regular tan button, um, on the screen, so to activate the inverse tan, you click second, in this case it's just a little arrow, and now it's popped up, tan to the negative one. I click that, and right away it shoots out an answer for the degree. So it's approximately 36.5 degrees, which is choice D. All right, next question. Okay, so 18 is another one of those parallel lines cut by a transversal problems, just like number one. And in this case, we have angle 11, which is 135, and it's an obtuse angle. 
And then we're get, looking for angle 8, which is an acute angle. It's clearly a different type of angle here. So anytime you have an acute and an obtuse in this type of diagram, you're going to add them together, and you're going to set them equal to 180. So if I have 135, I'm going to subtract that from 180 to see what I have left over. And I'm going to have 45 degrees left over for angle 8. So all of the acute angles in this diagram are going to be 45. And all of the obtuse angles in this diagram are going to be 135. Answer is choice A. Okay, next problem. All right, now in this problem, we are talking about a regular polygon. Now, we don't know how many sides that polygon has. In fact, that's what it's asking us to find. Now, it's talking about exterior angles of the polygon. We know that in any polygon, regardless of how many sides it has, all of the exterior angles, so the exterior angle sum, is 360. And the way that we figure out just one exterior angle, so an exterior, a single exterior, is we take 360 and we divide it e evenly among the number of sides. So in this case, we get 36 degrees when we do 360 divided by n. Now to get n, the 36 and the n are going to switch places, just like we do with some of those trig functions. When we have a variable in the bottom, we switch with what it is on the other side of the equal sign. So to get n, we're going to do 360 divided by 36, and that's going to give us 10. So that must mean that our figure has 10 sides. Okay, this would be called a decagon, like decade. There's decagon. There's 10 years in a decade. All right, next problem. Now, this problem is a little tricky. All right, so you may want to take some notes on a separate sheet of paper in addition to what you're going to hand in just so that you can review it before the EOC. Now, they give us the ratio of the areas. So the area ratio of two similar shapes, two similar polygons, is 25 to 100. Now, if I want to get this in simplest terms, because ratios are always in simplest terms, I'm going to divide both sides by the greatest common factor, which is 25. So when I divide by 25, I get the ratio 1 to 4. So the areas of these two polygons are in the ratio of 1 to 4. Now, these are some notes I want to give you. So the notes I'm going to give you here are, when we have two similar polygons, let's say it's this triangle and this bigger triangle, and they're in the ratio of A to B, the side lengths are in the ratio A to B. And that's usually given in feet or centimeters, any time that your units are just plain, not square, not cube, nothing. Perimeter, the ratio is going to be the same as the sides. It's going to be A to B. And again, that's because perimeter is expressed in simple units, straight units, feet, centimeters. Now, when we get to area, area, the ratio is going to be A squared to B squared, because we know the units are always feet squared, centimeter squared, some type of unit squared. And if your shapes are three-dimensional, the volume ratio is going to be A cubed to B cubed, and that's because our units are always cubed, feet cubed, centimeters cubed, units cubed. So in this case, when they gave us this 1 to 4, 1 to 4 represents a squared to b squared. It's the ratio of the sides or the ratio of the perimeters squared. So to undo that and just get a regular a and a regular b, what I'm going to do is I'm going to square root both sides because I want to get rid of that square. So if a squared is 1 and b squared is 4, when I square root both sides, a is 1 because the square root of 1 is 1 and b is going to be 2. That's the ratio of the sides, and it's going to be the ratio of the perimeters. So your answer here is going to be choice A. It's in the ratio of 1 to 2 for the sides and for the perimeters. It's a tricky question there.
Now, to just give you a little follow-up so that you can understand a little bit further, imagine I had two shapes and their sides are in the ratio of 2 to 3. That means that their perimeters would be also in the ratio of 2 to 3. Their areas would be this ratio squared. So they'd be 2 squared, which is 4, and 3 squared, which is 9. They would be in the ratio of 4 to 9. And then if it was a three-dimensional shape, their volumes would be in the ratio of 8 to 27. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. All right, so let's pick up with number 21. What's the measure in degrees of an interior angle for a regular decagon? So it's regular, so all of the angles are going to be congruent. And decagon means that the number of sides is 10 for your polygon. Now, if we're talking about interior angles, unlike exterior angles, it's going to vary depending on the number of sides that your figure has. So the way that we figure out what the sum of the interior angles are is by doing 180 times n minus 2, and that's going to give you the sum of the interior angles. Hopefully this is giving you some flashbacks from a couple of months ago. Now when we want to figure out just one, it says an interior, just a single interior angle, you're going to take the sum and you're going to divide by the number of sides, which is the same as the number of angles, that you evenly distribute your sum. Okay, so to get just 1, we're going to do 180 n minus 2 divided by n. So I'm going to plug in 180 times 10 minus 2 divided by 10. In this case, 180, simplifying the parentheses, times 8 divided by 10. In my calculator, 180 times 8 is 1,440 divided by 10. And I'm going to get 144 degrees for just one interior angle. And that's my answer. Okay, next question. All right, now in this problem, we're trying to figure out if this parallelogram can be a rhombus. So which of the properties will allow us to prove that this is a rhombus? So you need to think about what makes something a rhombus. Now again, if I go back to this quadrilateral tree, the family tree, looking at the rhombus properties, to be a rhombus, one of these three things has to be true. Yes, it's a parallelogram family member, but one, if all four sides are congruent, then that means it's a rhombus. Two, if the diagonals are perpendicular, then that makes it a rhombus. Or three, if the diagonals bisect the angles, then that will also prove that it's a rhombus. So any one of those will work. Let's see if any one of our choices allows us to show one of these three properties. All right, the first one, F, says AD, which is this left side, is perpendicular to the bottom DC. Well, if this is perpendicular to the bottom, that that means there's a right angle there at D, well, that's not going to work. That would prove it's a rectangle, but that wouldn't prove that it's a rhombus. So it's not going to be choice F. All right, next, um, AC, which is one diagonal, is perpendicular to BD. Oh, okay, so there's right angles at the intersection point. That is a very popular rhombus property, so I think it's going to be G, but I'm not going to be so sure until I go through all of my choices. H, angle ADC from A to D to C, plus the measure of angle DCB, okay, so this angle here, equals 180. Well, consecutive angles like that equaling 180, that's any parallelogram, and we already know it's a parallelogram, so that's not going to be it. All right, that's going to be working for any parallelogram. That's not going to prove it's a rhombus. And now the last choice, AC is congruent to BD. Okay, so if my diagonals are congruent, again, that's going to prove that it's a rectangle, but that's not going to be true for your rhombus. So it's not going to be choice I because that's a rectangle property. So I'm crossing that out, and it has to be choice G. Okay, let's pick up from the next problem with the next video.